Hey everyone, uh, we're solving this bio paper today, biology after a long time. This is May June 2022, 9700 paper 1 1. So, from 2020 onwards, you're gonna have 1 hour 15 minutes instead of 1 hour. And I guess the exam for the October November session is on the 16th, okay? So, I'll try to solve all three papers by then. And if you do have other requests, please feel free to comment below. And remember to subscribe to the channel if you like the content. Uh, so let's begin. Before we start, I just want to take a look at the threshold for this paper. So... One sec. Yeah. So the maximum mark is 40. <coughs> My bad. Excuse me. So A, B, C, D, E. So for paper 1-1, one, one, what do we have here? Um, A was at 30, B was at 25. A was at 30, B was at 25, C was at 21. Uh, D was at 18 and E was at 15. D was 18 and E was at 15. My bad. Um, so Basically, if you look at the difficulty of all the papers, of all these three, uh, it seemed like paper 1-2 was the hardest. Paper 1-2 was the hardest, let's say it was the twenty-seven. But paper 1-1 one, one, and 1-3 one, were on the easier side, right? Uh, so let's begin. Let's see how we deal with it. Let's begin. A student used a stage micrometer scale to calibrate an eyepiece reticule. The diagram shows the view of both the stage micrometer scale and the eyepiece reticle seen by the student. The divisions on the stage micrometer scale are 0.1 millimeter apart. The student removed the stage micrometer scale and viewed a slide with blood cells on it. The same lenses were used so that the magnification remained unchanged. The student measured the diameter of one of the white blood cells on the slide using the eyepiece reticle and recorded that it was 8 eyepiece units what is the correct diameter of the white blood cell so basically guys uh, we use the state stage micrometer for calibration with the eyepiece reticle because the stage micrometer is usually larger the divisions the graduations are larger that is why we can't use the stage micrometer directly uh, to find out actual lengths okay so basically we know that the divisions on the stage micrometer are 0 0.1 millimeters apart so it basically uh, is equal to the length between 50 and 90. So 0 0.1 millimeter is the same as this length from 50 to 90. So 50 to 90, 90 minus 50 is basically 40 EPG units. So 40 EPG IBIS radical units uh, is 0 0.1 millimeter. So one EPG unit will be 0.1 by 40 millimeter. So the WBC, which has eight EPG units, uh, will be 0.1 by 40 times eight millimeter. That is 0.1 by 40 times eight, which is 0 0.02 millimeter. Now you guys know how to convert millimeter to micrometer, right? It's basically into 10 to the power three, which is uh, 20. 20 micrometers, so the answer should be 1C, alright? So please check. Yeah, the answer to 1 is C. Let's move on to number two. Four students were asked to match the function with the appearance of some cell structures in an animal cell. The appearance were, uh, the functions were listed below. mRNA passes through the ribosomes, produces through to the ribosome. Uh, it's basically the pore in the nuclear envelope. Produces the mitotic spindle during cell division. Packaging of hydrolytic enzymes that will remain in cell. So uh, three is Golgi body basically. Three is Golgi body. Or the Golgi apparatus, and this is the pore 
in the uh, nuclear envelope. Nuclear envelope and produces mitotic spindle. So this is basically the centriole. Okay, this is the centriole. The centrioles and the centrosome is the location of the centrioles. Okay, there are two. So the appearances were listed by letter. So let's see. So <clears throat> the centriole is a non membranous um, organ. Okay, so two has to be non membranous. So it has to be a uh, W or Y since the central is not okay, so that doesn't help Now the central is actually Cylindrical it is not spherical. That is why I'm going to exclude a and C. It can't be W. It has to be Y next It's between a B and D then so the Golgi body. It's basically a membrane bound a sac which is arranged in uh, flattened stacks so three should actually be Z that is why I'm gonna opt for um, D also, you can check X. X is a double membrane interspersed with pores. Yeah, that's the nuclear uh, membrane, the nuclear envelope. Okay, which size range would include most prokaryotic cells? Okay, prokaryotic cells are typically. Okay, prokaryotic cells are typically like what about a eukaryotic cell? It's uh, usually around you know forty uh, micrometers usually. And a uh, prokaryotic cell is usually around 40 to 100, and a prokaryotic cell is usually around 1 micrometer, so the answer should be B. Okay, it isn't in the nanometer range, all right? So the answer is B. Uh, you can check more of this in the course book basically. See this uh, in chapter 1, you'll have the size given. Here you go. So they're usually around 1 micrometer, 1 to 5, and the eukaryotic cell is usually around 40. Right? That's what you need to know. 4. What is present in a typical prokaryotic cell and typical eukaryotic cell? Okay. No, both of them do not have 70s ribosomes. Uh, eukaryotes have 80s. But here's the tricky part. Basically, in eukaryotic cells, we also have mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts. And according to the endosymbiont theory, they were prokaryotes at one time. So this was a trick question. Eukaryotic cells also have 70s ribosomes. Even though mainly we have 80s, but 70s ribosomes are present in the chloroplast and mitochondria. Uh, not all eukaryotic cells have starch. Uh, we do not have circular DNA in the cytoplasm. Prokaryotes do. And yeah, prokaryotes do not have. Centrioles are not present in, um, you know, all organisms. Understood? Like, uh, centrioles are missing in plants. Special for animals. Which statement of viruses is correct? Uh, they all have a ca uh, capsid made up of a protein. They do. That is a part of uh, the virus. It is true. Uh, some virus may have DNA or RNA. They all have an outer membrane of phosphorus. This is wrong. They all contain ATS ribosomes. Wrong. Samples of glucose, sucrose, and a mixture of glucose and sucrose were divided into two halves, M and N. M was then tested with Benedict solution. N was boiled with diet hydrochloric acid, neutralized, and tested with Benedict solution. Okay, so that's the test for a reducing sugar. Non-reducing sugar, I mean. We break it down, and then it becomes a reducing sugar. The color of the solution was compared to color standards. Which table identifies the correct color change for these samples? So glucose, sucrose, and a mixture of glucose and sucrose. Okay. So M, if we test M with a Bendix solution, so we're going to get a positive test, but it will only be due to glucose. <laughs> okay, it will only be due to glucose and the mixture, slightly due to the mixture, okay. So basically, I'm going to tell you something. A is wrong because uh, this part can't be blue. This part can be blue. It has to be like, you know the color change, right? It's going to go from blue to green to yellow to orange to a brick red precipitate. So this can be blue because we do have glucose here. So we would get a positive test. Similarly, B is also wrong because, okay, this is yellow. 
but this should also be uh, colored because in the mixture we do have a reducing sugar glucose that's why these two are wrong okay now what about C and D uh, this looks good guys uh, this gives us a yellow color this is also yellow this is yellow this is yellow great <laughs> in sucrose we're gonna get a blue color this is a must because it's a uh, non reducing sugar now in N basically what happened was we've boiled it with diet HCL so we've actually hydrolyzed the sucrose so now everything is a uh, you know that sucrose is made up of glucose and fructose so all of them are reducing sugars right now that's why afterwards afterwards what's gonna happen is in the boiled solution for in since we have both glucose then a lot of glucose due to the breakdown of sucrose and we have fructose all of them are reducing sugars we should be getting a red color we should be getting a red color understood because we have a lot of reducing sugar now let's see between C and D what's the better answer here in the mixture we get red this is correct because we have a mixture of everything that means that there's a high concentration of reducing sugar now between these two our decision comes down to this basically the sucrose when it breaks down um, uh, basically from blue to red is an exponential change I don't think we have enough reducing sugar to produce this change like from blue it might go to yellow but going to red is a bit too much so the answer should be C <clears throat> this is the best answer here and glucose uh, you know glucose will remain yellow like even if you hydrolyze it right like uh, glucose can't be hydrolyzed it can't give a better color change it will still remain yellow so do you guys understand the uh, difference because this is this is actually the determining factor glucose can't be hydrolyzed so even if you do hydrolyze it or if it if you don't the color change will remain the same so this can't be possible right so this is a determining factor but you know if you break down enough sucrose it might have turned red so actually this is not the determining factor rather than that the first one glucose won't turn red all right number seven uh wait what the options haven't loaded here actually weird is everyone facing this problem what even wait up let me let me check the main paper the nine seven is yeah weird yeah in the main paper it hasn't it's it hasn't been printed properly that's weird well let me check another site extremely weird this is QP11 yeah it's the same for every paper apparently and so no worries um, basically which molecule contains one for uh, glycosidic bonds <coughs> oh the options are here themselves I guess so one for glycosidic cellulose actually contains beta one for glycosidic bonds Amylose contains alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds only. It doesn't contain alpha 1,6. That's amylopectin. It contains both. Glycogen contains both 1,4 and 1,6 alpha glycosidic bonds. So all three of them do contain 1,4 uh, glycosidic bonds. It wasn't mentioned whether it was alpha or beta. So C is the answer. 8. The diagram shows three triglycerides, X, Y, and Z. Which way is correct for these triglycerides? contains saturated fatty acids okay so basically uh, these two are unsaturated 
mainly okay but look at this side chain over here. this this one is saturated this one is unsaturated this is one is unsaturated unsaturated saturated unsaturated saturated 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 if you have the presence of a single double bond that means it's an unsaturated fatty acid so actually this was a trick question all three of them do contain at least one saturated fatty acid however only x and y contain unsaturated fatty acids z does not contain an unsaturated fatty acid okay that is why the answer should logically be a contain more than two different types so that's x and y okay hopefully that makes sense nine some foods contain hydrogenated vegetable fats these are unsaturated fats that have been converted to saturated fats which property of the fats will have changed so basically if you convert an unsaturated fatty acid to a saturated one do you see these kinks on the chain <laughs> this will become more straight as a result they will fit closer together but beforehand the fit wasn't that great because it was bent there was a kink so honestly after conversion to saturated fatty acids the hydrocarbon chains fit more closely together okay but the solubility in water actually decreases they will have less double bonds and they will remain liquid no no so unsaturated fatty acids have a tendency to remain liquid but saturated typically remains as a fat I'll pop a polypeptide chain contains a specific number of amino acids and how many peptide bonds are present in this polypeptide okay so check this guys suppose if you have two amino acids you're gonna have one bond if you have three amino acids you're gonna have two bonds so do you guys see the trend so depending on the number of amino acids if you have two amino acids one bond three amino acids two bonds so it's basically the formula is n minus one the number of bonds will be one less than the number of amino acids okay so the number of amino acids will be one more than the number of bonds. Which statement is correct? Amylase, ribose, and phospholipid are all macromolecules. Cellulose, glucose, and catalase are all polymers. Oxygen, fructose, and ribose are moles. Okay, let me um, cut these according to the options. So, <coughs> my bad. Uh, basically, guys, sucrose is a disaccharide. So D doesn't make sense. Amylopectin is a polysaccharide. Deoxyribose isn't one either. Cellulose is a polymer. Glucose is not a polymer. It's a monomer. Amylase is a protein enzyme. It's a macromolecule. But ribose is just a sugar. So it's not the answer. So the answer has to be C. Deoxyribose, fructose, and ribose are all monosaccharides. Correct. 12. Uh, a student used colorimetry to monitor the hydrolysis of a protein by a protease enzyme. The student used a used bio -red solution to determine the concentration of protein in the hydrolysis reaction. The student produced a calibration curve using known concentrations of protein. Which diagram shows a calibration curve? So guys, in a colorimeter, we actually can measure transmission or absorbance. Check this. Uh, for the Biorate test, it's the test for proteins. Okay, so you guys need to know about the Biorate test properly. Where is it in the course book? Um, presence of starch. Presence of lipids. Here you go. So, in the bio test, the nitrogen forms a purple complex with copper two ions, and this forms the basis of the bio test. So, the reagent is the biorate reagent, and you can use it as two separate solutions. It's basically potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide and copper two sulfate, which is blue in color. Alternatively, there is ready made bio. So, we mix them and to stop the copper ions reacting with the hydroxide ions and forming a precipitate, this ready mixed reagent also contains sodium potassium tartrate or sodium citrate, okay? Or else a precipitate will be formed of copper hydroxide. You know that from chemistry, a pale blue PPT. Now the biorate reagent is added to the solution to be tested. No heating is required. It occurs at room temperature. A purple color indicates that the protein is present. The color de develops slowly over several minutes. <coughs> All right, so the greater the protein concentration, the greater the protein concentration uh, the greater the purple color 
okay the greater the intensity of the purple color so if the test tube is very purple basically if you pass light through it all of it will be absorbed absorbance will be greater so light cannot really pass through the other end so the greater the intensity of the purple color the greater the absorbance absorbance means the tendency of a solution to absorb light so it doesn't basically allow light to pass through it so transmittance would be zero so the graph would actually be like this for transmission okay it's actually the other way around anyway a student compli uh, completed an experiment to measure how increasing concentrations of substrate affects the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction the student then repeated the experiment after adding a fixed quantity of a reversible competitive inhibitor which row describes the effects of a reversible competitive inhibitor on the enzyme activity so basically reversible competition competitive inhibition can be reversed by increasing uh, the concentration of the uh, the substrate so if you uh, increase the substrate concentration uh, the rate will increase again okay so 13 is between uh, b and c in non competitive there will be no effect little effect now where does the inhibitor bind it actually binds to the active site itself not the allosteric site okay that's why it can be reversed now 14 it shows a liposome liposomes can be used to move therapeutic drugs into cells of the boy to treat conditions such as cancer you will learn more about this in a2 right, in genetic engineering so we treat you we use it for therapeutic uses it has therapeutic uses so basically we transport the drug here uh, which is actually you know like it allows transport because the outer region the, he the heads are hydrophilic in nature so even though the drug you know might be susceptible to water or it may be hydrolyzed it can be prevented by keeping it inside we keep the drug inside to prevent hydrolysis okay you guys need to understand that but uh, there's there's this thing that like it depends you can even keep the drug here or here so you guys know that these these heads are hydrophilic in nature so if you transport the drug in location 2 the drug's nature will actually be hydrophilic this is hydrophilic and the drug located here the tails are hydrophobic right so in one the drug has to be hydrophobic so it's hydrophobic in location 1 and hydrophilic in location 2 so the answer should be C some processes occurring in cells are listed uh, which uses ATP this uses ATP this uses ATP facilitated diffusion is a passive process phagocytosis requires ATP so it's actually 1 2 and 4 15 should be B okay diffusion normal diffusion and osmosis are passive active transport and all bulk transports are actually uh, require energy the graph shows the change in concentration of a solute inside a cell uh, what explains this change in concentration okay so basically yeah something can diffuse out of a cell if you actually endocyte if endocytosis occurs the concentration would actually increase inside the cell so two can't be the answer i'm going to exclude two is between b and c so three exocytosis true I I exocytosis gets rid of something from inside the cell so this is right osmosis may also be correct okay one and four are true for both things like either into the cell or outside the cell but here the main factor was endocytosis has to be false because we are measuring the concentration inside the cell endocytosis will actually increase the concentration inside the cell but here we are actually decreasing it so our answer is in fact 16 is b because two is wrong only next 17 uh, the indicator crystal red changes from red to yellow when put into acid four blocks of agar containing crystal red were cut to different sizes measured in millimeters the blocks were submerged in acid all other variables were kept constant the time taken for each of the blocks to completely turn yellow was recorded which of the four blocks became completely yellow most quickly okay so this depends on diffusion and diffusion depends on the surface area to volume ratio okay so let's check so 3 into 30 into 30 3 into 30 into 30 that's 2700 
Now the for, uh, formula for surface area is base area 2 times base area or basically we can't use this since we do not have the uh, okay 2 times base area plus perimeter into height you could do that or basically just you could add up 6 base areas it's basically 2 times uh, are these the dimensions yeah these are dimensions measured in millimeter okay let's do that 2 times base area plus perimeter of base into height so this is the block basically so what if the base area is this 30 times 30 okay so that's basically 30 times 30 into 2 which is 1800 plus perimeter of base 30 into 4 which is 120 times the height which is just uh, 3 so that's 120 into 3 plus 1800 that's 2160 so the surface area to volume ratio is 2160 by 2700 which is 0 0.8 the ratio is 0 0.8 so that's it for A let's look at the other ones so here the volume is actually 6 into 6 into 6 which is 216 and the okay so here we could find out the area pretty easily 6 times 6 that gives us one area that's 36 millimeter square times 6 um, times 6 gives you the area so 36 is the area of one side okay so if you multiply this by 6 you're gonna get the surface area which is uh, 1 1 is to 1 it's basically 1 is to 1 the surface area ratio to, to surface area to volume ratio All right, but uh, you get this question quite often. Honestly, rather than measuring the surface area to volume ratio, in D, basically in D, you're gonna get the same surface area to volume ratio as B. It's going to be one because the volume is twelve into twelve into twelve, one seven to eight. Eighty-eight. Well, let me try this. Yeah, this is also one is to one. What about C? This is eight sixty four the volume, and the area is twelve into twelve into two two eighty eight, and twelve into four to six plus two eighty eight. It's five seventy six. This is actually a uh, zero point six seven is to one. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, there are some confusing questions about this type of question seventeen. They were submerged in acid. Now, all other variables were kept constant. So, for these questions, typically, uh, the trick is the one with the shortest dimension. Uh, you won't look at a the surface area to volume ratio rather than that you just have to look for the um, small one with the smallest dimension I've mentioned I've done questions like these in uh, 2021 I think the year 2021 where I told you that the shortest the one with the shortest div uh, dimension at least one uh, will be the winner it will uh, you know diffuse through it the fastest the surface area to volume ratio is important for other things when the lengths are proportional really but just think about it if you have one end which is very small it's very easy to penetrate through that area do you guys understand so that's why 17 is in fact a 
although the highest surface area to volume ratio does go to B or D, okay? Which process requires a mitosis? 18. One sec. <clears throat> Repair of cell structures, reproduction of unicellular eukaryote, the growth of multicellular organisms from a single cell. Cloning requires mitosis. Repair of cell structures by protein synthesis. Uh, this can occur naturally without mitosis, so two is wrong. Growth of multicellular organisms from a single cell, true. Like from, we became embryos from zygotes. Reproduction of unicellular eukaryotes. That is also mitosis. So it's 1, 3, and 4. 18 is B. Wait. 19. Which events listed are part of the cell cycle? All three. We know the cell cycle mainly has two parts. We have interphase over here. And then we have mitosis over here. And we have cytokinesis. So interphase has the... G1 phase, the S phase, G2 phase. There, are, there is G0 in some cells. We have mitosis, which consists of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And then we have cytokinesis, okay? So all three are correct. <laughs> 20. Telomeres is an enzyme that adds nucleotides to telomeres. Which statement about telomeres is correct? Telomeres actually prevents the breakdown of the telomeres prevents aging. A high concentration of telomere raised in cell damages DNA during DNA replication. This is rather the complete opposite. A high concentration of telomeres in cancer cells limits the rate of tumor growth. The low concentration of telomeres in stem cells means that these cells can divide an unlimited number of times. This is wrong. If it was high, it would have been true. The low concentration of telomeres in body cells means that these cells can divide a limited number of times. This is true. Also, number B, a high concentration of telomeres in a cancer cell limits the rate. No, it actually facilitates the rate of tumor growth. Okay. So high telomeres means more growth. Less telomeres, low telomeres means less growth. 21. The photomicrograph shows cells at different stages of mitosis. Okay, guys, so what is happening over here? <coughs> Cell P shows anaphase. Clearly, it's anaphase. It's not telophase, though. It's moving towards it. T is basically the uh, T is metaphase, right? T is metaphase. P is anaphase. R is prophase. Q looks like telophase or cytokinesis, something like that. So the correct order should be O oh, and S is just, you know, it's preparing. Okay, so what's the actual um, process? S is just before prophase, it's in interphase right now. So what's the correct order? Interphase followed by prophase, which is R, followed by metaphase, which is T, followed by P, which is anaphase. And then we have, um, whoa, wait up. And then we have telophase Q. So S, R, T, P, Q, S, R, T, P, Q. Uh, this is correct. Four is correct. I'm going to go with four. A is wrong. Cell P shows anaphase, uh, which is also true. One is also true. So this has to be wrong. It's between B and C. Spindle formation is occurring in cell Q. What? Cell Q is... It's impossible because where does spindle formation occur? <clears throat> telophase is like uh, the end stage, right? So spindle formation actually begins occurring uh, in late prophase and early metaphase, late prophase basically. So it should have been R, which is why 2 is wrong. I'm not going to take 2, which is why the answer is C. The amount of DNA in cell R is the same as in cell T. R is it the same as in cell T. True, true. They both have double, right? See, they have double the DNA. If it was S, maybe it would have been wrong, you know? Because mitosis has already taken place. 22. 
Bacterial uh, cells with DNA containing only the heavy isotope of nitrine are allowed to reproduce for uh, three generations. In a culture medium containing the normal isotope of nitrine 14. Okay. So guys, I have a diagram for this actually. You guys should uh, remember this. Check this. Here you go. Whoa. Wait up. So yeah, uh, basically in the first gen we have 100% nitrogen 15. In the second gen, you know that DNA replication is semi-conservative, right? <clears throat> so one strand will be new, one strand will be normal. So in the first gen, What's the first gen actually? What's the first gen? You guys need to understand that. What is the first gen? Vector cells with DNA contain only the heavy isotope of nitrogen 15 and are allowed to reproduce for three generations. So even though this is the first cycle, after the first cycle, we are going to get the first generation. This is the second generation and this is the third generation, okay? So in the first generation, we have 50% nitrogen-15 and 50% nitrogen-14. However, both the DNA molecules contain uh, the... What's the question? Which percentage of DNA molecules produced? DNA molecules means two strands, okay? Which percentage of DNA molecules produced contains strands with the heavy isotope? See, both strands contain the pink strand. Both DNA molecules contain the pink strand. So 100% of the DNA molecules contain the pink strand or contain nitrogen-15. Following that, this will divide into two stages. Now, look at this. The pink strand only exists in two of the four ones in the second generation. That means two out of four means that's basically 50% of the DNA molecules. So it should be 50%. And at the end stage, look, only two out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two out of eight which is 25% hybrid DNA. So here we have 100% hybrid DNA. Here we have 50% hybrid DNA. Here we have 25% hybrid DNA. That's what this means. They, they actually meant hybrid DNA. This is a common question, okay? You'll find other uh, variations soon. A bacterial circular DNA molecule is 2600150 base pair long. 26% is adenine. So what about cytosine? So we know that adenine binds with thymine. So it's AT. So 6% is adenine. Thymine will also be 26%. So 100 minus 26 minus 26 gives us 48%. <laughs> so 48% will be divided between cytosine and guanine. 48 divided by 2 is 24. So CG, that's... 24, 24. How many cytosine bases would be in the DNA molecule? Okay. So that's 24 by 100 percent, 24 percent into 2600150. That's basically how much? <clears throat> so you might get tricked here. If you just multiply 24 percent into 6 uh, into 2600150, you're going to get 624036. Basically, like check this. This is the tricky part. We have a bacterial circular DNA molecule which is two million six hundred thousand one fifty base pairs long. Okay. So here they're talking about base pairs. Okay. So how many so if you have two six zero zero one five zero base pairs, that actually means you have two six zero zero one five zero into two bases. So that's what the question asked. How many bases do we have? So since twenty five six percent of the bases are added in, twenty six percent are also thymine. That means C and G are forty eight percent. So C is forty eight by two twenty four percent of the total bases. So if you multiply this by 24% you're gonna get your final answer 24 by 100 into 2600150 into 2 so you're gonna get a final answer of 1248072 tricky 
most candidates would typically choose A here, okay? Be careful, 23C. Which statement relating to the structure of DNA is correct? Two DNA strands are joined to each other by... No, that's present in one DNA strand. It's joined by hydrogen bonds, okay? The alignment of bases to form a double helix is only achieved between anti-parallel strands. That's true. Three hydrogen bonds are formed between all bases containing purines. No. Purines are adenine and guanine. Adenine forms two hydrogen bonds. Come on. The number of cytosine bases always equals to the number of thymine. Wrong. It should be guanine. 26. 25. Students sketched a diagram to represent the process of transcription. Which part of their diagram shows a non-transcribed strand? non-transcribed strand okay so guys careful over here in 25 b is the transcribed strand strand because look this is what molecule exactly this is the mrna molecule this can be clearly seen by the presence of uracil so this is being transcribed d is basically the mrna and c is basically a bubble the transcription bubble and a is the non-transcribed strand so a is the correct answer which way is correct for the what's the enzyme required here RNA polymerase. Which row is correct for the movement of water in a root? Okay. We have two pathways. The simplastic pathway and apoplastic pathway. Okay. So, if you take a look at chapter 7, I guess. It was 7, right? This is very important for you guys. The simplest and apoplast pathway. Apoplast means entering the cell walls. We move through the cell walls. We do not use the pores. We do not use the plasmodesmata. But in the simplest, we use the plasmodesmata. Okay? You guys need to understand something though. Ap the apoplast pathway is blocked. Where? Due to the band of Seaburn, the Casparian strip in the endodermis. Okay? So, apoplast pathways through. the intercellular spaces oh so it won't be lignin it has to be suberin okay that's why in the casparin strip clearly it's not lignin right it has to be suberin it has to be suberin and the apoplast path pathway is closed only the simplest pathway is open you guys need to understand that okay only the simplest pathway is open the apoplast pathway becomes closed So the apoplast pathway through intercellular spaces, the simplest pathway through intercellular spaces. The Marxian answer is A, but the apoplast pathway is supposed to be blocked in. Uh, let's check this though. Wait. In a young root, the suburban forms bands and cell walls called Casparin strips. The simplest remains open. In an older root, entire cells become suburized, closing the simplest pathway to two. In certain cells called passage cells, no water can enter these cells only the simplest stream is open this band is called the Caspian strip and goes right around the cell it stops water through the apoplast Okay. The 
Galois pathway through intercellular spaces. Simplex pathway through intercellular spaces. In Appleplast, we have uh, we move from cell to cell through intercellular spaces. Oh, okay, okay, my bad. This the question just asked you. I misinterpreted the question. Uh, they just asked you, like, uh, how does the Appleplast pathway work? It moves through intercellular spaces. Simplest is not through intercellular spaces. And what is present in the Casperian strip? Super. They didn't ask you, like, which pathway is uh, still open due to the super strip. Th that wasn't the question. They just asked you, like, what path does the Appleplast pathway take? It's intercellular spaces. Simplest takes plasmodes matter. Okay. Great. So, 27. The table contains some information about uptake and movement of water and of mineral ions in plants. Using the information provided, which factors will affect the uptake and movement of water or of mineral ions? So humidity of water or of mineral ions, anything works. So if it becomes more humid, there will be less evaporation. So water uptake will reduce. One is correct and vice versa. Surface area of root hair cells will increase uptake. Oxygen concentration and temperature. So one and two are correct for sure. 1 and 2 have to be correct, so the answer is A. Basically, temperature increases evaporation, right? So, more osmosis will occur. And what about oxygen? Basically, if there's more oxygen, there will be more um, respiration. You can think of it that way. So, more CO2 will be given off. And it's like a vicious cycle, more photosynthesis will occur. So we need more water for that, basically. So what's the correct explanation for number three? Let's see. <clears throat> yeah more oxygen concentration or decrease in oxygen concentration okay let's think about decrease if there's a decrease in o2 concentration uh, respiration will also decrease right and it does affect photosynthesis in another way, which does affect the uh, uptake of water and mineral ions. So 3 is also correct, okay? But yeah, you could get to this answer through elimination. 28, important question. Which changes to the water potential and the volume of the solution the flow MCF tube occur when sucrose is moved from photosynthesis and leave into a flow MCF tube? So this is the leaf. This is the uh, companion cell and this is the uh, flow MCF tube. So, sucrose is moved from the leaf into the flow MCF tube. So, if you move sucrose, the water potential actually decreases. But as a result, water will flow in since the water potential decreased. <clears throat> That's why the volume increases, okay? Very common question. You'll find this every year. 29. A student wrote the following statements about a possible mechanism for loading sucrose from a source. When energy is released from ATP, the release changer is used to move sucrose through a co-transporter protein in the component cell. Wrong. <clears throat> this is the component cell, flow MCF tube. This is the cell wall. We use energy to pump H plus inside here. But sucrose moving down through the co-transporter is a passive process, which is why A is wrong, 1 is wrong. It has to be D. As sucrose is moved into the component cell, the pH in the cell wall of the component cell decreases. True, because the H plus comes along with the sucrose, so the pH will
wait, wait, wait. wait. Uh, one is wrong because it's a passive process. Energy is only required to pump H plus into the cell wall. <clears throat> as sucrose is moved into a companion cell, as the sucrose moves into the companion cell, the pH in the cell wall of the companion cell decreases. The proton pumps in the cell membrane of a companion cell move sucrose into the phloem CFT element. No, the proton pumps in the cell membrane of a companion cell move protons into the cell wall of the companion cell. Okay, so three is also wrong. So two is correct. But there is an issue here. There is a slight issue. Check this. Basically, in the uh, loading loading process, what happens is we pump H plus into the cell wall. As a result, there is a high concentration of H plus in the cell wall. pH decreases, more acidic. And then, passively, it will come down along with sucrose. The high concentration of H plus ions drives transport of sucrose molecules. Okay, So this is co-transport. This does not require ATP. So according to our question here, as sucrose is moved into a companion cell, so as sucrose moves from the cell wall, into the companion cell down the gradient of hydrogen the pH in the cell wall of the companion cell decreases I guess they're talking about the overall process because this overall process does in fact uh, cause an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration of the cell wall. But the moment the H plus comes down with sucrose, this is true that H plus does decrease from here. But this overall process increases the H plus concentration in the cell wall. So yeah, in a sense, uh, 2 is correct. Okay, Number 3, 30. The diagram shows the transverse section through an artery. It has tunica, intima, media, and externa. <clears throat> so intima is basically endothelium. What about media? The layer that they have marked with X. So it basically contains smooth muscles for, you know, uh, constriction and dilatation. It has elastic fibers to withstand pressure and it also has collagen. Okay, it has all three. This is very important. You guys need to know this. <clears throat> this is basically chapter 8, transporting mammals. So you need to know the structure of veins as well as arteries, all right? Check this. It's just endothelium, the inner layer. Middle layer contains elastic fibers, smooth muscle, and collagen. The outer layer contains some elastic fibers and collagen. It doesn't really contain muscle. Okay, this is a very important question for you guys. <laughs> 31. What is the systolic blood pressure? Interesting. So, basically the systole corresponds with the contraction of the ventricles. The systole corresponds with the contraction of the left ventricle. And it corresponds to the maximum blood pressure in the arteries. This is the one we measure in the brachial artery. Okay, When we measure blood pressure using a sphigo manometer, the maximum blood pressure in the arteries is the systolic blood pressure. And the time corresponds with the contraction of the left ventricle. So it's not really the blood pressure of the left ventricle, but rather the pressure in the arteries, but it occurs due to the contraction of the left ventricle. Okay, 31 is C. Now we have a cardiac cycle. The diagram shows pressure changes in the left side of the heart and the heart over time. The length of this cardiac cycle is 0 0.6. Points 1, 2, 3, 4 indicate when atrial ventricular valves and semilunar valves either open or close. Let's see. What is the total time during one cardiac cycle that the atrial ventricular valves and the semilunar valves are both closed at the same time? Interesting. So this is also present in the course book. You need a good understanding of this concept of world. <clears throat> Let me show you. Wait up. So you can uh, study this picture if you guys want. While I was tutoring, I mentioned this graph. Where is it? Wait, I don't have it over here. 
Let me find it out for you. Here you go. This is a good picture. Yes, I'm gonna give you like two, three pictures to study. This is just from Google, okay? Good images. <clears throat> Anything else? Um, yeah, this this works. I guess these are enough. So basically, st let's study this. The blue line is the pressure of the left atrium. It always remains low. Left ventricle. The pressure in the left ventricle increases by a lot. Similar to the contraction of the left ventricle. Okay. <clears throat> so when the left ventricle contracts, when the left ventricular ventricle contracts, it basically opens the semilunar valves and closes the, you know, the <laughs> when the ventricles contract in general, <clears throat> they open the semilunar valves and close the bicuspid and tricuspid valve. Okay, the mitral valve, basically in the left side. Which is bicuspid and the tricuspid valve on the right hand side. <laughs> so, when the left atrium actually contracts, the bicuspid or the tricuspid valve is open. See, when the atria contract over here, the bicuspid valve and tricuspid valve are open. Okay, that's the contraction of the left atrium. Now, afterwards, when the uh, ventricle starts contracting, there will be a moment when basically the lub dub, these sounds, the lub is actually due to the closing of the atrioventricular valves or the tricuspid and bicuspid valve. So there will be a moment where, look here, just when the ventricle starts contracting, the atrioventricular valve will be closed and the semilunar or the aortic valve will also be closed during this time span. But afterwards, the semilunar valve will open and blood will flow through the aorta. Okay, now the semilunar valve is open but the atrioventricular valves are closed. Afterwards, when the pressure in the ventricle drops, there will be a time when, due to the decrease in pressure, the atrioventricular valves will close again, and the uh, sorry, the semilunar valves will close again, and the atrioventricular valves are still open. But when the atria starts contracting again, or at, I mean, when the atria start filling again, what happens basically is that due to the increased pressure in the atria, the um, atrioventricular valves open again, but the semilunar valves still remain closed. So essentially, what happened? Here, the atrioventricular valve closed, but the semilunar valve was still closed. At this moment, the atrioventricular valve was closed, but the semilunar valve opens. So in this time span, both were closed. Here, the semilunar valve closes, but the atrioventricular valve is still closed. So both of them are closed, but in this moment, the atrioventricular valve opens due to atrial filling, increased pressure in atria. The ventricles will fill, but the semilunar valve is still closed. So I'm mainly looking at these two time spans where both the valves are closed. Okay, hopefully I could clarify, see if this makes sense. I tried my best. So mainly I'm looking here, basically from this time span to this time span over here. In this time span, both are actually uh, closed. Similarly here, it's closed, it's also closed here. So basically this part and this part. So this is 0 0.12 to 0 0.12345, 0 0.15, that's 0 0.03 seconds on this side. And here it's 0 0.312345, 6, 
0 0.36 to 0 0.4, which is 0 0.04. So 0 0.04 and 0 0.03, that is 0 0.07. We should go with C. Okay, 32 is C. Great. Uh, which reactions take place in the capillaries surrounding an alveolus? Okay. Carbon dioxide plus water equals to carbonic acid. Impossible. Because you need carbonic anhydrase to catalyze this reaction. That is only present in RBC. One is wrong. Carbon dioxide plus hemoglobin. Carbamino. Oh wait, do they are they do they want us to look for RBC? I'm actually a bit confused. Let's see though. It's basically happening in an alveolus. So this is the alveolus. This is the capillary. We have the RBC over here. Typically, what happens in the alveolus? O2 comes from here to here, and CO2 goes from the blood to the alveolus. So, oh, they want us to think of it in this way. I get what they mean. Basically, guys, um, since here we want carbon dioxide to exit, we are in fact going to break down H2CO3 to form water and carbon dioxide, okay? And oxygen will come into the RBC, bind with hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin, HbO8. <clears throat> also, one other thing will happen. Not carboxyhemoglobin, carb amino hemoglobin will break down. Carb amino hemoglobin, carb amino hemoglobin will break down to form CO2 plus HP. Okay, these are the reactions that are occurring in an alveolus and in a muscle, the opposite will occur. It will be from right to left rather than left to right. Okay, so carbon dioxide plus water to carbonic acid. Wrong, it's the other way around. This happens carbon dioxide plus hemoglobin to carbon amino hemoglobin. Wrong, it will be the other way around. So one and two are actually wrong. Okay. Hemoglobinic acid. Okay, let's talk about these two, three and four. Uh, we need to figure out which are which ones are correct. So hemoglobinic acid. Uh, where does this usually form? This usually forms in the muscles where there is lactic acid production, and it actually leads to the Bohr effect, the Bohr shift, which shifts the curve to the right hand side. So which allows more oxygen to be lost. <laughs> But the reverse Bohr shift, or the this is called the hamburger. This is the hamburger shift. The hamburger shift occurs in uh, the alveolus. So basically, in muscles, what happens? Basically, hemoglobin combines with acid to form hemoglobinic acid, which uh, allows more O2 to be released. In alveolus, the opposite occurs. Hemoglobin acid, hemoglobinic acid will break down to form hemoglobin and uh, H plus, which shifts the oxygen saturation, the PO2, partial pressure of oxygen, the hemoglobin oxygen saturation curve to the left hand side. So, 3 is in fact correct. And number 4, hydrogen carbonate ions plus hydrogen. Oh, yeah, H plus plus HCO3 minus does form H2CO3, which again forms H2O plus CO2. This is correct. 3 and 4 are in fact correct. 33 is B. Good question. Last ones. Which statement explains the importance of the chloride shift in RBC? Okay, basically it maintains ion balance. You know that in the RBC, a lot of HCO3- is produced. So that gets out of the cell, right? Most of the carbon dioxide is transported in blood as HCO3- bicarbonate. But there will be a deficit of negative charge inside the cell, right? That's why chloride ions enter the cell to maintain balance. That's basically it, honestly. So hydrogen carbonate ions diffuse into plasma from RBC and chloride ions diffuse into RBC to maintain a balance of positive and negative ions. Okay, next. The photomicrographs show a cross section through the lining of the part of a respiratory system. Great. The respiratory epithelium is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, so let's look at 35. Goblet cells are visible between squamous epithelium cell, epithelial cells. Smooth muscle is visible. The section can be a bronchial as cartilage is visible. Honestly, this is hyaline cartilage. This is probably uh, the uh, it's a part of the trachea. It looks like the C-shaped cartilage. Okay, and clearly the smooth muscle is visible, guys. Look, I I'm going to show you a photomicrograph. Wait, photomicrograph of trachea. Check this. With labeling, then it makes sense to you guys. Wait up. Can you 
can't find a good enough picture honestly Is this good enough? Wait. See if you guys understand these. This is a much more, you know, this is a picture with greater magnification. I'm trying to find a better picture for you guys. <laughs> so yeah. Honestly, basically the layer This is the ciliated columnar epithelium over here. We zoomed in over here. This is the cartilage, basically. This part is the cartilage. Uh, I can understand that by looking at the lacuna. See the lacuna? So this, these are the lacuna zoomed in. This is hyaline cartilage, basically. So we have the mucosa, which contains the lining epithelium, connective tissue. We have the submucosa, which has some glands just below. So it can be a bronchial because uh, only cartilage is cartilage is only present in uh, the uh, trachea and bronchus. Okay, trachea and bronchus. So basically, three is correct. This is a correct fact. I'm gonna go for three. <coughs> Smooth muscle is visible here. If you zoom in on this figure, this is the adventitia, the last layer. This is the adventitia, but you can see that there's smooth muscle over here. Can you see that there are glands over here? This is the lining. There are glands. There are there smooth muscle and vessels over here, as you can see. Smooth muscles always lie below the lining epithelium. Okay, like if in mucosa there's a layer called lamina propria and muscular is mucosa. So there there is smooth muscle over here. If you zoom in, this is not the muscle layer, by the way. This is the adventitia. It's like a, a covering. So the smooth muscle is over here, and these are the vessels, okay? So two is also correct. Goblet cells are visible between the squamous epithelium cells. So these are just cirrostrate fed ciliated columnar epithelium. What does a goblet cell look like, if you're uh, curious? Uh, let me show you a picture. Goblet cell photomicrograph. Does the course book have a better picture? Right. Chapter 9, right? So, yeah, uh, you will only find cartilage in these two parts and goblet cells as well. But how to identify a goblet cell? Goblet cell. Yeah, it's basically a goblet shape, but um, wait. So basically, uh, we can see this in our photomicrograph. The goblet cell won't have cilia, and basically, it will have droplets of mucin. There will be a lot of staining 
could I clarify? And it's actually goblet shape, so it will be more thick on the upper end, on the upper portion. Could I clarify? Here, no one's really thick on the upper portion. Everyone has cilia, and the nucleus is located over here. And no one's really thick on, it's not, no cell looks like this, you know? No cell looks like this. There's no goblet cell here, okay? So we cannot see them between, it's, it's not visible. That's why one is wrong, we're gonna go with two and three only. I couldn't really find a picture for a uh, goblet cell online. Wait, let me, let me see if I can find one. Give me a bit. Uh, goblet cell in track, yeah. Basically, this is what it looks like. Come on, see this. The, uh, the mucin is clearly visible. Here, it would have looked like this, but we we don't see anything on the top, right? On the staining, on the electro, the on the photomicrograph. Okay, so it's fine. It's clearly you can clearly identify it, alright? Anyway, thirty six. The surface tension of the layer of liquid lining the alveoli tends to pull the walls inwards, so alveoli could uh, collapse. That's why we produce the fluid surfactant, which prevents the collapse. Okay. So mainly it's surfactant. So this chemical is called surfactant. This is the main factor. And it's the only factor, honestly. So surfactant prevents it. It is secreted by alveolar macrophages. Okay. Uh, so when children are just born, after 28 weeks, they can uh, produce that. So it's a viable birth. 37. What will reduce the rate at which bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? Prescribing two antibiotics with different modes of action. That is true. So the bacteria, we can be more confirmed that the bacteria dies. Finishing a prescribed course, true. Prescribing different antibiotics for the same bacteria, true. If you keep on prescribing the same antibiotic, the bacteria will get more uh, you know, exposure to that and might develop resistance. All right, last three. T lymphocytes have a protein PD-1 on their surface. Some cancer cells have a receptor molecule on their surface, which binds with PD-1, inactivating the T lymphocyte. Okay, so for 38, um, T lymphocytes have a protein PD-1 on their surface. Um, some cancer cells have a receptor molecule on the surface which binds with PD-1, inactivating the T lymphocyte. A monoclonal antibody is lambrolizumab. Lambrolizumab or iambrolizumab. Looks like an, it's an I basically. Iambrolizumab has been produced against this receptor. So this is the lymphocyte. It has this receptor called PD-1. So we have a drug, drug called ambrolizumab, which actually binds to this. Uh, trials show that 54 of 135 people with advanced skin cancer who were given ambrolizumab, the tumors more than halved in volume. So this is the lymphocyte. The protein is PD-1. So the cancer cell basically has a receptor on their surface. This is the cancer cell's receptor, uh, which actually binds to our uh, PD-1 on lymphocytes. As a result, the lymphocyte becomes inactivated. But if we... Um, Administer the drug, the monoclonal antibody, ambrolizumab. It actually binds to the site PD-1, so the cancer cell cannot bind. As a result, the inactivation does not work occur, and the people who are given ambrolizumab <coughs> showed that, like in 54 out of 135 people, the tumors more than halved in volume. In six of the 57 people who were given the highest dose, the tumors even disappeared. Okay, what may be correctly concluded from this information? Oh, wait, it was Lambro. It was, this was a small little, my bad. So Lambrolizumab binds with a receptor on the surface of skin cancer cells.
Oh, wait, wait. I misinterpreted the question. The monoclonal antibody is uh, produced against this receptor. So, not against PD-1, but the receptor of the cancer. So, okay, okay. So, my bad. <clears throat> so, this is the receptor on the lymphocyte. Sorry, the protein, PD-1. And this is the receptor on the cancer cell. So, the monoclonal antibody, lam lambrolizumab, um, basically, this is the drug which binds to the receptor on the cancer cell. As a result, this can no longer bind to the uh, bind to PD-1 on the lymphocyte, and the cancer cannot inactivate the lymphocyte. So that's how it works. Okay. So lambrolizumab binds with the receptor on the surface of the cancer cells. Uh, this is correct. This is fine. Cancer cells to which lambrolizumab is bound cannot inactivate T lymphocytes. That is also true because since it's bound to this receptor, it can't bind to PD-1. Two is true. Lambrolizumab targets and kills cancer cells. So we aren't actually sure about the mechanism of three. We just know that it binds to the receptor so that it cannot inactivate lymphocytes. Lambrolizumab allows the patient's own immune system to kill cancer cells. This is true. Okay. Now the lymphocyte can be activated, so which can kill the cancer cell. So 38 for 38 B is the correct answer. Good question. 39. A person's blood group is determined by the presence of antigens. <clears throat> on the RBC, the table shows the antigens and antibodies. During a blood transfusion, it is essential that the person receiving the blood does not have antibodies to the donor's blood. Which blood groups can be given to a person with blood group AB? So you guys got to understand, for a person with blood group AB, uh, you have both A and B antigens, so you have neither antibodies. That's why the people with AB blood groups are superior, so they can take blood from any donor, because they don't have any antibodies. The recipient does not have any antibodies okay so we don't actually look at the donors antibodies but rather we look at the recipients antibodies since the recipient does not have any antibodies uh, so it doesn't matter which blood you give all of them should work but in recent times we don't follow this method a person with AB blood group is usually given AB blood group but it's fine if you give the other ones as well okay which types of cellular stim so in O in O blood group, we have both antibodies. That's why a person with O blood group can only receive O. And for someone with O negative blood, it's really harmful. It's really uh, risky because it's very rare to get O negative, right? Which types of cells are stimulated to divide by the cytokines produced by T helper cells? Okay. So T helper cells, TH cells, they are TH1, TH2, TH17. Basically, in med school, I uh, study immunology. The It's much more detailed there. But A level Im immunity has helped me a lot, like it helped me through the process. I knew the basics beforehand. So, according to our uh, syllabus, T helper cells stimulates B lymphocytes and T killer cells. Okay, the helper cells stimulate T killer cells, cytotoxic T cells, and B lymphocytes. They cause their uh, proliferation, right? Uh, but T helper cells also do stimulate macrophages in a way. In a way, that's more complex. You don't need that. So according to your syllabus, just know that T helper cells stimulate B lymphocytes and T killer cells. Okay. So that is all, guys. I uh, hope you liked the video. If I did make any mistakes, please feel free to uh, write that down in the comments. I'll fix that then. Uh, remember to subscribe to the channel if you like the content. I'll link the playlist for bio paper one up here. And when I solve May, June 2022, Paper 1, 2, I'll link that up here. And when I solve major 2, 1, 3, I'll link that down here. Okay, see you guys.